That was great worship this morning. Really, really good. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, worship team. Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> and that's what the message is about, too. Be ready. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, we do we do bow our hearts before you and Lord I didn't know. okay. Oh. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Lord, we do just thank you for what you're doing in this hour. We thank you that you are preparing a bride. And oh God, I pray that we would all hear that we would all awaken to the hour. Yes, amen. Lord, that we would do whatever it takes, oh God, to cooperate with you, to be that worthy bride for your son. Oh God, we want to see you. Father, as I know we've prayed before, we want to see you on that day, on the gladness of your heart when your mother crowned you with the wedding crown. Oh, Lord, we want to be that bride right beside you. But, Lord, we need your help. We even ask for your help. God, help us, Lord. We need your help to get ready. Yes, oh, Lord. Lord, there's an urgency yes, like Lord. there's never yes, been before. Yes. Lord, you just see it in our nation. Lord, with the evil arising, Lord God, the lawlessness arising. Lord, and how they're calling evil good and good evil, Lord. Even they're changing even what men and women are, Lord, even in cards, getting cards for Father's Day just overwhelmed me, how they had a generic card, Lord, but there's not a generic, Lord, it's either male nor female, and Lord, we pray that you would give us a heart that would even break for what we see, Lord God, that we would just just be, feel what you feel for that, but have that oil of gladness as Brian prayed. Oh God, we just thank you that you're doing something unique, even though we don't like some of the things we're seeing. We know that you're doing something. May we be that remnant, oh God. We ask, oh God, for a real work of your spirit. We want to be ready. We want to be those that are waiting and getting oil for our lamps, Lord, that you would even release an increase of the ability to buy, to get oil from you, that oil of intimacy. I think that's a call that, that's going out. It's a time for deep intimacy yeah, with you. Yeah. It's not just surface, but the deep, the deepest part of you is calling out for the deepest part of us, Lord God. We want the deep. We were made for the deep, not the shallow things of Christianity, but we want you. We want to know you in the deepest part, Lord God, just as you said. Lord God, you're calling and I pray that we would answer the call. I pray that you will be our first love, Lord God, that we would truly give you everything just as we've just finished studying about Esther, Lord. She surrendered all Lord God, to be that bride. And, oh, God, may we do the same. And, Lord, I ask for that revelation, that you give us the revelation of your Son, even through this teaching. Open the eyes of our spirit. Lord, we just thank you for these teachings. We thank you for the word that you have given to Ken. And, oh, God, we thank you for the rising of you within him, Lord God, that you would come and that you would speak, Lord, that Elijah anointing, oh, God, that he's, he's sending out invitations to the wedding. And, God, I pray that people will heed, that there'll be a heeding of the call, Lord God. And we ask that you come and we ask that you speak, not by power, nor by might, but by the Spirit of the Lord. And God, we shout grace, grace to every mountain of obstacle. God, I pray that there'll be a fine tuning of our ears to hear and our spirit what you are saying to the church, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I will have to start out here by tying my shoe because if I don't do it, I'm gonna, I will uh, worry about it the whole time I'm preaching. <laughs> Uh, probably. <laughs> when Donna and I go for our walks, I usually get her to tie my shoe if it comes untied because if I get down on the ground, it's hard, it's hard to get back up. But 
one of the joys of getting older. But uh, <laughs> but at least we can still walk. So I'm excited about that. Yeah. All right. Well, Amen. Well, this is uh, we're continuing to teach on our life school forerunner school class. Uh, a theology of the bride, and uh, this will be the last one that I do in here, but we have some others that we'll do online and everything. Uh, but this is uh, session seven in that class, uh, and in session six and now in session seven, we've been looking at the bride in the teachings of Jesus, specifically uh, in this last week of his earthly ministry. And so this will be the second one of those. Session six, if you remember, we dealt with Matthew chapter 22, the, mar the parable of the marriage feast. And now in this one, we're going to deal with the bride in Matthew's, Matthew chapters 24 and 25. Primarily, we're going to look at the parable of the ten virgins, but we will also look at the introduction uh, where Jesus talked about the end times in Matthew 24. We'll talk about the parable a little bit, the parable of the two servants. Uh, and then we'll talk about the parable of the talents. And, you know, I won't be able to go through verse by verse I would, with all three of those. I would be here all day. But, uh, but, uh, so, but we are going to really focus in detail on the parable of the ten virgins because it is a major teaching of Jesus uh, related to the bride making herself ready. Very important that we really get an understanding of what this parable is, is saying uh, and, and not only get an understanding of it, but as forerunners that we'll be able to actually communicate to others what it says. Because as forerunners, we need to be messengers and we need to, uh, to wake up the church uh, and the world too, but primarily the, in, in the church as to what the Lord is saying related to the end times. Uh, because the scripture verse that, that Brian shared a few minutes ago is so true that the Lord will come like a thief in the night to many. Uh, that, that theme comes through all the way through Jesus' teachings and Paul's teachings and other Peter's and others. He's going to come like a thief in the night, not, to, not necessarily to us. He doesn't have to do that to us, but he is to others. And as forerunners, he wants us to be a people who will really be a voice, be a messenger, be one that will speak truth uh, into people to help them wake up to, to the urgency uh, of the hour. So anyway, that's just a little bit of an introduction, but that, that's what we're going to be talking about, those parables there. So let me set the context. Let me start by setting the context of Matthew chapter 24 and 25. Uh, hopefully you remember from our last session, session 6, that in recorded in Matthew chapter 21, Jesus had entered in his triumphant entry. Uh, you know, we talked about the second coming entry where he'll ride on a white horse with his armies of angels and disciples who have made themselves ready to execute judgment on the Antichrist system and all the, and go to the marriage supper of the Lamb and all that. But he comes in almost like a, a, a parallel to a degree entry into Jerusalem the week before uh, he goes to the cross. This time, rather than riding on a white horse, he rode on a donkey, signifying his humility and his invitation uh, to people to, to make themselves ready. And so immediately after that, he went to the temple. And while he was at the temple, he, he confronted the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He heal those who were, uh, who, who were uh, blind and lame and those who needed healing. So he did ministry to, the, to, the, to those who were in need and he confronted uh, the, the religious spirit there. And in that context, he spoke Matthew chapter 22, the parable of the marriage feast. He spoke that con in that context and, and, and he was talking about the banquet hall and the one that didn't have uh, wedding garments on, being cast into the outer darkness where there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. So <clears throat> there comes, he eventually leaves, this is all taking place in the last week of his ministry on the earth, that he, he finished that ministry at the temple and then he and his disciples then begin to go uh, to the Mount of Olives. Uh, and that's where he records what's recorded as the Olivet uh, Discourse, 
where he taught, which is recorded in Matthew 24 and 25. It's just one big um, message, really, in a sense. So he does that. And so as he goes, um, he says these words. To, I'm just setting the context here now. He, he, he says this as he's leaving. He says this to his disciples that the temple would be destroyed. In fact, he said this, not one stone here shall be left upon another. And I'm sure that probably shook up the disciples when they were, he was walking with them and he says, okay, we're, this temple is going to be destroyed. And so uh, here's what they said. Uh, this is what it's recorded. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying this, tell us when will these things happen? When will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? When will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Now, it's really interesting. They asked that question. Their concern, their interest was, well, when's all this going to happen? And what's, what's it going to be like? What's going to be the, the circumstances around all that? And, you know, I'm just really meditating on that this week. And I thought, you know, that's really the same question that most of the, most of the church is asking right now. Uh, you, you know, I just uh, happened, I saw it this morning. I got an email from some minister. I don't know how I got it. But they were inviting me. Uh, it said, we invite you to come and learn about the Lord's imminent return. While we can't know the day or the hour that Christ will return, we can say with certainty that the scripture is fulfilled every day and that we are nearing the end. Uh, and this, this guy is going to talk about prophecy in the Jewish calendar and how and why we can know that Lord's return is just around the corner. So what is he saying? Uh, he said, come find out when the Lord's going to come and what will be the signs of his coming. And that's what most of the church is about. But you know, Jesus' answer uh, to his disciples essentially was this, get ready. That was what he was saying. Now, he did talk about some of the signs, you know, famines and earthquakes and wars and rumors of war. Rumors of war. And so there is, that, there, there is that element to it. Obviously, there's that element. And that element, to a degree, is important because the Lord said, uh, you, you know, it's going to come as a thief in the night. But then Paul said, but not to you. It doesn't have to be a thief. We don't know the day or the hour. We don't know the exact time. But we do, it doesn't have to be a, as a thief in the night uh, to us. We can have a sensing that he's coming. So it is important to a degree to understand those things. But that's not the primary, that's not the primary response to these things. The primary response is get ready. Get ready. Jesus said that, and, and, you know, again, going back to Matthew 24, I'm kind of setting the context here for these parables. Um, he's, you know, this passage, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. Uh, and then, you know, it goes, it goes on. I won't spend the time to go through the whole thing, but it does say this. In the context of that, therefore, be on the alert. Be on the alert. Be watching for that. And then just a, a verse or so later, it says, For this reason, you also must be ready. You also must be ready. And so, you know, this is the last week of his ministry. The, he's talking about the important things that, that they need to be aware of. Yes, there are signs coming and there's some important issues that you need to be aware of, but the most important issue is to be ready, to be ready. And so in that context, he, he, he teaches immediate one after another three parables, uh, the parable of the two servants, the parable of the ten virgins, and the parable of the talents. And, I, you know, honestly, I been walking with the Lord now for 40 plus years and I, just as I began to study this this time did it really become uh, clear to me that these three parables are all connected and related to the bride making herself ready. I just looked at them kind of independently but I'm going to show you the connection because there's a powerful 
statement, a very simple statement in the parable of the two servants that really we need to let it resonate in our hearts, let it resonate in our spirit, uh, really the rest of our life. Uh, but I want to show you the connection of it first. So I'm going to have to read, to do that, I want to read the parable of the ten virgins in its entirety and then summarize a little bit from the other two before we go in detail into the parable of the ten virgins. So Matthew chapter 25, verse 1. Still that same uh, setting on the Mount of Olives and Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And then he says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were prudent or wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them and the prudent took oil in, their, in flask along with their lamps. Now, while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at, the, at midnight, there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the, to the prudent or to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. Uh, and while they were going out to make the purchase, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast and the door was shut. Later the other virgins came saying, Lord, Lord, open up to us. But he said, truly I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. So that's the parable of the ten virgins. Now just for, for now, I want you to reckon, just remember these two statements in here to, to, um, as I connect it to the parable of the two servants in a minute. That five were foolish and five were prudent or wise. And also, while the bridegroom was delay, delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But remember those two uh, phrases. Now let's go... Uh, and read, and I'm not going to be reading scripture the whole message, so, but I, I do want to set the context here. The parable of the talents. I'm not going to read all that. It's a long parable. You, you, you can go and read it, and you're familiar with it. But it, the parable of the talents is a, is a story of a man who goes on a journey, and he called his slaves, his servants, and he entrusted his possessions to them. So these are believers he's talking about. Uh, and to one he gave five talents, and to one other two, and to another one. Now the, the talent is a is a lar very large sum of money in this, but it's a, it's a picture of things a, a lot more than just money. It's a picture of money, but it's also a picture of just gifts and just things that he's entrusted uh, to us. Uh, and so you'll see that you know to the one they, they were to go out and do business with those with those things. And so in a long time after that, he came back. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Uh, and then to the, to the one who had given five and the one who had given two, he said, well done, good and, faithful, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. Now I'll put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Uh, and so he's gonna put, he put them in, in charge of different things. And then, of course, to the one that had the one talent and didn't do anything with it, he, he just buried it. He buried his talent. He said, throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, that's talking about, and again, a banquet that we talked uh, about last in, the, in session six, that that banquet, because the, when a guy... Well, that wealth would return from a, from a journey. They would give him a banquet. So he said, I'm going to cast you out, the one who had the one, I'm casting you out of the banquet hall, uh, uh, you know, where, there, out, where there's outer darkness. And we dealt with this a lot in the last, in session six. Uh, the outer darkness is not necessarily hell and probably not at all hell. It's outside the banquet hall, outside the place where he settled the accounts, where it was dark, where it was dark. Um, so he's talking here about believers because the one who had the one talent was, was a servant of 
the, the, the man who went on the journey. He was, get, he was entrusted a gift by that, but he just didn't do anything with that that he had been given. Uh, now, okay, I, I know this is getting a little tedious, but uh, this is important. Um, now, let's look at this, the, this, let's look at a key, few key points from the, the, the parable of the, of the two servants, which is right before the parable of the ten virgins. All this is in Matthew 24 and Matthew 25. Okay, listen to this now. Who then is the faithful and sensible slave whom his master will put in charge of his household to give them food at the proper time? Okay, who then is this? Now, okay, the, the, the Greek word translated in the New American Standard, which I use, sense, is traded, translated as sensible, is the word wise. It's the very same word as the wise virgins of, of the parable of the ten virgins. So what does he say? Who's the faithful slave? Okay, now what is that? Okay, what is the faithful slave? What does that connect you to the parable of the talents. It connects you to the parable of the talents. Who is the, the, the wise slave? Connects you to the parable of the ten virgins. Then he says, for the next verse, 46, he says, truly I say to you, he will put him in charge of all of his possessions. What does that connect you to? The parable of the talents. It connects you to the parable of the talents. He put him in charge of your faithful and small things. I'm going to put you in charge of many things. Okay, so he's, this verse, this, this parable of the two servants connects what Jesus is saying to both the parable of the talents and the parable of the ten virgins. Now, Here's his challenge. This is what I want you to really hear. You know, there's also, there's other things. My master is not coming for a long time, verse 48. That's the same word in the Greek. It's actually one word in the Greek. It's the same word as delaying in the parable of the ten virgins. So what is he saying? So what this parable of the two servants is an introduction and an explanation of the parable of the ten virgins and the parable of the talents, connecting them both to the bride making herself ready. And so what does he say there? This is, this is, this is the key to why I'm sharing this. In verse 46, he says, Blessed is, you know, who is the wise, faithful and wise slave? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. When he find, when he, so he finds him so doing. So what is he saying? He's saying, okay, there's the, pa the parable of the ten virgins. It talks about uh, the virgins having their lamps lit and, and all that. We'll go, we're going to go through that in a minute. So he says, he's, talk, he's introduced that parable and he says, Blessed is the servant who's doing what he talks about in the parable of the ten virgins. You have to be found so doing those things that are in that parable. And then he talks about the parable of the talents. And he says, blessed is that slave who he finds so doing the things that are talked about in the parable of the of the talents. And I won't take the time to, to support all this, but all of that is connected to the marriage and connected to celebrating at, celebrating at the marriage feast of the Lamb. So there's a, there's a real challenge that he's issuing even before he goes into the details of these two parables of the, of the ten virgins and the talents. Even before he goes to the details of it, he's saying, You'll be, it, you, it, you'll be blessed if you'll heed these words that are in these uh, two parables. So there's a call there to do that. So anyway, let's find out what, you know, the parable of the talents is fairly simple. He's given you something to do. Be, do it. Do it. Be about doing it. 
don't hide your gift. You know, it's not, it's, he's using money, but that's just an example. Money is part of it, obviously. We need to use our money for the kingdom. But it's more than money. He, give, he gives us each different gifts, different things, and different assignments. And he wants us to be using those things. You know, there's a, there's a real issue. I think it's an incorrect issue in, in part of the body of Christ. Because of some of the, the uh, you know, some of the movement in the, in the global church where the global church is teaching uh, hyper grace and some of the, you know, some issues that we don't agree with prosperity gospel and things like that. So there's a, there's, a, there's a mindset that's come out of there. There's all I need to do is pull away from all that and it's just me and Jesus. Me and Jesus and I'm just going to focus on loving him and making myself ready. That's all, that's all I'm going to do. And, and it's a pretty pr predominant view among certain people. In this parable shatters that Amen. it does it's, it's a it's a that mindset is only half of what Jesus is saying yes he's saying develop your me and Jesus relationship but that's not all you have been given you have been given a gift stir it up and use it to trade for the kingdom. And then he'll put you in charge of other things. So there's kind of a two-aspect two dimension here. One is what we're going to be talking about mostly is the internal relationship with Christ, the parable of the ten virgins. But the other part of it is using what he's entrusted to you. Use it. Do business with it. And who is the, who is the, the faithful and wise servant? who is blessed, the one he finds so doing. Both of these things, what we see in the parable of the ten virgins and what we see in the parable of the talents. Can I hear an amen on that? Amen, amen, all right. Or oh me, maybe. But amen probably would be a better, would be a better thing. And you know, if you don't know what your gift is, God will show you. He'll show you what you're supposed to be doing. But we need to be so found, so doing. Okay. All right. Uh, now let's look at the parable of the ten virgins. We want to go, we want to walk through it verse by verse uh, and just explain what it means. Okay. The first verse, Matthew 25 verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. So there's several things we want to draw from, from this first, first verse. The first one, the parable makes it clear that there really will be a, a wedding between Christ and his bride. There really, and we've said this in, in other sessions, so I won't uh, labor on the point here. But there really will be a wedding. It's not a, it's not a picture. It's not a type. It's not just some way of explaining something. The kingdom is compared to a lot of different things uh, in the teachings of Jesus. Uh, to a seed that's sown and to other things, pearl of great price and other things. But when he speaks of it as a wedding and a, and a ten virgins going out to meet the bridegroom, that really is what's going to be happening at the end of the age. So it's first is there really will be a wedding with, between Christ and his bride. Uh, secondly, still from verse 1, the parable can be entitled the parable of ten Christians. The parable of ten Christians. We call it the parable, and it's in parable of ten virgins in our Bibles, but it's really the parable of ten Christians. Now, a lot of your commentators uh, will say that it really isn't ten Christians. It's five who are Christian and five who maybe think they're Christian or profess to be Christian, but really aren't Christians. Well, I say no to that. It's the parable of 10 Christians, and I have four reasons for that. Uh, the first one, and so as forerunners, we need to not only believe this, but we need to be able to support it 
to others as we encounter them because others, you know, especially those in the evangelical church and the evangelical community, uh, because most of the commentators come out of that out of that stream, and most of them would say that it's just five Christians and five non-Christians, which really takes a lot of the pressure off of us. You know, okay, uh, this, the, the other stuff, the, the warnings of that is not really talking to us, it's talking to non-believers. And we know we're a believer, so we don't have to worry about it. But that's not what it's saying. It's, it's talking about a parable to 10 Christians. And I have four reasons for that. First one is that Paul called believers pure virgins. You know, in 2 Corinthians 11, chapter 2, he says, I betrothed you to one husband uh, as a, a pure virgin, betrothed you to one husband. So, you know, Paul talks about that and as the, the virgins being a picture of Christians. And so the scriptures are consistent among themselves. Uh, and so that would be one reason. The second reason is both the wise and the foolish had an initial supply of oil. Both had an initial supply of oil. Of course, of course, oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. So they both had oil. Now the wise virgins had a flask that, that carried extra oil, but both had oil. So both had that oil within their lamp. Uh, of course, the lamp, the oil, and the lamp, and all that is part of our inward. Uh, life in Christ. Uh, and we'll talk more about that in a, in a second. So that's the second reason. Third, all 10 virgins went out to meet the bridegroom when he came. Now, you know, shout, the, the, behold, the bridegroom came, comes. Go out to meet him. And all 10 went out to meet him. Now, I have a feeling that people who are not born again, when the Lord comes back, they're not going to come out with anticipation to meet the bridegroom. It's going to be a terrible, terrible day of great fear. Uh, so another reason that they, all ten are Christians. Uh, and the fourth re reason is just look at the number that, you know, why didn't they say two Christians or 25? Well, 25 would be hard because it's an odd number, but 26 Christians the 13 of each. Why did, they, why did they use the number 10? Well, 10 throughout the scripture kind of conveys the totality of an issue. There were uh, 10 commandments, the totality of the overview of the law. There were 10 plagues of Egypt. Uh, there were, you know, in the church at Smyrna, they were in prison for 10 days. So there's an element of, of, of completeness there. And they're saying that uh, it's just a total number. So what we're saying here uh, is that the kingdom of heaven can be comparable to 10 virgins, 10 Christians who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now let's look at the lamp for a minute. It's still in verse 1. The, the lamp... The, 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 the kind of lamp they were talking about was a, it, it had a container that had oil in it that was made either of pottery or iron. It had that. And then it had a linen wick. And then it really was a torch. Uh, it was like a, a torch that, that, that was uh, fueled by oil. Uh, and so the picture of this is, it's interesting that Larry prophesied this during the worship time about let your light shine. Uh, the lamp was the light that shined in the darkness. You know, when they, when the, most of the weddings took place at night. So the processional that they're talking about in this parable uh, was 10 uh, virgins with a, a lamp, a torch that had a bright, that had fire that burned out of it that lit in the darkness. And so, like Larry's word was, let your light shine before men. And that's what the lamp is. That's what it, what it is. They carried lamps, okay? And, and so, it's a picture of the, the ten virgins, their light, which is, the, which is the life of Christ flowing from within them outwardly, the, the life of Christ being a light 
in the darkness of the world because it was at night. It was a, it was a dark time and there were no street lights uh, at that point in time and no electricity or anything. And so very dark and the, and the torch was the light. And so, the, you know, so it's like let your light shine. So they went, they took their lamp, their light, which is the, a, the, a, a picture of the external, our external life in Christ that reveals Christ within us to the world. Let your light shine. Okay, that's verse one. Now let's move on to verse two. I'm not going to talk that long about every verse because we've got 13 verses here. So it'll, it will, we'll, we'll move quickly on through some of these. And five of them were foolish and five were prudent. Five were foolish and five were prudent or wise. Uh, so here's the, the point of application, and I'll support it. Five of the virgins were lukewarm, the, the foolish, were loop, lukewarm in getting ready, and five were prudent or wise. Or prudent would be, you know, paying attention to it. Five were lukewarm. We're getting ready. Let me talk about that word foolish because it'll support that at this point. Foolish is the word, the Greek word moros, M-O-R-O-S. And the meaning of this word is dull, sluggish, or thoughtless. Uh, Thayer's Greek lexicon adds uh, imprudent or without forethought or without wisdom. Uh, and I like Kittle's de definition here, he says this, the point of the parable of the virgins is readiness. And that is the point of the parable. And the fault of the foolish virgins is a lukewarmness that takes participation in the banquet for granted. It takes participation for granted and thus brings down judgment on itself. And he also wrote this, the foolish virgins were lukewarm in their pursuit of readiness. Lukewarm in the pursuit of readiness. And so going back to the verse, five of them were foolish and five were prudent. And so here's what we see. Okay, what, what is he saying about the foolish virgins? He's saying that the five who were foolish were lukewarm in their pursuit of a preparation, a pursuit in their pursuit of being ready. Uh, in other words, he wants, the Lord is saying to them, remember, his disciples had asked this question, what's the sign of your coming? And he said, be ready. And, he, and so here he's saying, don't be lukewarm. Don't be lukewarm in your pursuit of readiness. Uh, be in a, rad in a mode of radical pursuit of readiness. Okay, let's move on. Verse 3, For when the foolish, when the foolish took la their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the prudent took oil in flask along with their lamps. Okay, so we, we want to talk about the oil for a minute. The oil in the lamp is significant or symbolic of our inward life in Christ. It's our inward because what happened? The lamp is the fire, the, tor the, the torch burnt. That's the external life in, in Christ. That's how our light shines to a dark world. But what fuels in this picture, what fuels the fire? It's the oil. And the oil is in a, a hidden vessel. Because the vessel that contained the oil, that part of the lamp that contained the oil, was made of either pottery or iron. So it was, in, it was not visible. The oil itself was not visible. It wasn't a glass container. It was pottery or iron. So it was hidden. And so that's what, that's what fuels our light to the world is the oil, which is a picture of the Holy Spirit. But the picture of the Holy Spirit, who, who we know is, is first in our spirit, and then it permeates out through our soul and through our and through our body, and eventually as it permeates outward, as we allow it to come forth out of our self-life and overcome sin and all the different issues there, as it becomes true like that, then we become a light. The more it comes out, the more of a light we become, the more our torch burns brightly in the darkness of the world. So the, the oil in the lamp is 
our inward, it's a picture of our inward life in God, our inward life in Christ, our secret life in Christ. Now, the foolish virgins did not have enough oil. They were lukewarm toward their preparation, so they didn't have enough oil in their, in their lamp. They had, they had initial supply, but they didn't have enough. Now, the wise ones carried oil in their lamp, but they also carried an extra supply of oil, a flask that had an extra supply of oil because the, the, the lamps you know, didn't contain a lot of oil, to burn for a long period of time or, you know, otherwise you would have to have shoulder harness or something to hold the lamp up, I guess, or something, you know, if it'd be so, so heavy. So they had a, so it only contained a small amount, so they had to frequently replenish the oil in the, in the chamber of the actual oil so that there was a need for a flask of extra oil. Um, and so and it becomes a picture, really, of our relationship. You know, we can't, we have this relationship with Christ, but we can't just fill up our relationship one time and then go our merry way for the rest of our life because we'll run out of oil. Uh, and so there's a, there's a need for a continual or periodic refilling uh, of, of that. So that's the, uh, took no oil with them. Now, let's go to verse 5, 6, and 7. I'll read those together. Let me comment a little bit more about the oil. The oil hidden within the virgin's lamp symbolizes the believer's internal relationship with Christ. And I just jotted in just a, a few little notes here. It involves seeking God in the secret place. It involves abiding in Him. Uh, it involves hearing His voice the motives of our heart, obedience to him, all of these particular issues that are there. Now, the Lord really spoke to me this morning as I was preparing for this message. And he was saying, look, we're all, we're all different. We're all, we all have different gifts. We all have different, uh, you, you know, uh, callings. You know, our, our life, we're at different points in our lifestyle and different things like that. So there's, there's all of those things are, are different uh, in us. And so, you know, you, I, can't, I can't ask you to do what God is asking me to do or Brian to do or someone else to do. The key, though, because we're all different and we all have different gifts. And, you know, I mean, I love to study the Word. But I know my call is to be a teacher. That's my primary call is to teach the scriptures and to be a forerunner, maybe apostolic type of teacher. That's my call. And so I have to study, you know, studying the word for me is a part of the way, the only way I can let my gift come forth. But I enjoy it. I mean, I love it. And, I, and, and you know, God meets me at that point in time. But, and there's some of you here who are, who are prophetic intercessors, seers, and, and all that. And, you, you know, you, when you have time with the Lord, it's like you're watching a, a video, you know, a movie or something. And that would be, I don't ever see like that, but that would be exciting. But, you know, I can't ask somebody who's not a seer to function like a seer. I can't ask somebody who's not a teacher to act like a teacher. But there, but there is a pattern that God has for you in the secret place that develops oil in there. And he wants you to discover that, but not, remember, not to be lukewarm in preparation, which in this case is related to that internal building of that oil. Do not be lukewarm in it. And whatever the, but the Lord will lead you into, a, into the way, the unique way he has for you. Uh, but to be passionate and radical in your pursuit of it. Amen? Does that clarify maybe? Okay. All right. Okay. 
Now, verse 5. Uh, now, while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight, there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins rose and trimmed their, lamp, their lamps. Uh, a wise, this is the point I will make here. A wise virgin will pursue an active relationship with Christ throughout their life, whereas the foolish do not. The act, an active relationship with Christ. Even though there's a delay, uh, you, know, and the delay you know, what happens a lot of times is in, in, the, in period, there's periods of delay as the Lord tarries. There's periods where, you know, our, our radical pursuit can grow a little bit weak at times. You know, maybe it's, you know, it could be on any number of things. Sometimes it's schedule of things that we can't avoid. Sometimes it's uh, just problems and issues that r arise in our life. Um, but the wise, even in those times of delay, wake up and go back to that. So maybe that you're in a, a period of drowsiness as it relates to your relationship. If so, it's just... Ask the Lord to forgive you and, or, and just say, Lord, I want to renew that, that passionate pursuit of my internal life in Christ. It's time for me to do that. You know, that type of attitude there. Um, so now move on to verse 8. The foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil uh, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, no, there will not be enough for us and you too. You go, go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. You have to go to the dealers. And there's, uh, you know, one of the points there is that the oil of one's relationship with Christ cannot come from another person, but must be the result of a personal relationship with Christ. We can't get oil from another person. Now, when I say that, I mean, we can draw we can draw from other teachers, you know, from people we watch online or things like that. We can draw from them, but, you know, I can't get my oil from Donna's relationship. That's the point I'm making. Yeah, Donna has a powerful relationship with the Lord. I can't get my oil from her relationship. You know, I can't uh, get my oil from, you know, some my favorite teacher or preacher. I can draw from them. And there is a measure of oil, I think, that maybe comes as we heed what, th what they say. But we can't depend on some, I guess that's what the point I'm trying to make. We can't depend on someone else's relationship for our oil. We have to go to the dealer's Ourselves. And the only dealer is the Lord. The only, he's the only one who sells oil. So we have to go to him. We have to go to him. We can't just uh, depend on someone else or coming to church or being in a church where people are seeking oil. We can't depend on all that. We have to go ourselves to the dealer to get our own oil. Again, we're all different, and we get it in different ways. But there's certain things that we get. You know, we seek, we abide, we hear his voice, we pray, we do all these things that, that involve the secret place. We do these things and we get our uh, oil uh, that way. Okay, let me hear an amen on that. Amen, amen. okay, okay. Amen. Number 10. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with, with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Uh, okay, when the bridegroom comes, only those who have pur purchased sufficient oil throughout their life will be allowed to enter the marriage feast of the Lamb. You know, it's pretty, it's pretty clear. The door was shut, and once the door is shut, it will not be reopened, you know, the heavenly door. You know, it was interesting... The, you know, I wrote the book, A Worthy Bride, back in 2009, I think it was. And it was interesting. John and Heather were getting 
married. They had a they got married in August of that year, and the the wedding was kind of downtown Atlanta on a Friday night, and you know there's a lot of traffic and stuff like that. But there were certain people. There was a door on the side, kind of toward the front of the place where the ceremony was, and then there was a door in the back, and there were people. Uh, and it wasn't related to the, the specific people. I'm not trying to point out the specific people, but it made a powerful point. You know, we were at a wedding, and right at the time the wedding began, the door was shut. And there were people there who were ready, who wanted to come in to the wedding. But they couldn't come in. I mean, but we, you know, we let them in the back at this time, so it's not a perfect picture, but... <laughs> <laughs> but they couldn't get in on the side there, yeah. So it made a powerful point because we were we were kind of dealing with all that back as a church back in 2009. Um, so let's not, I mean, let's not pass over this point. Those who are ready went in to the marriage supper. And so we need, you know, and, uh, you know, the, the, the foolish virgins had to go and buy oil. And by the time they got the oil, it was too late. So we can't just wait to the last minute and try to buy oil and then, as, and then come back and think we won't have enough oil. It takes a lifestyle of purchasing oil in order to get the sufficient oil to be allowed to go in, to be one of those wise virgins to go in uh, to the wedding feast. Those who were ready went in with him. And you remember Jesus' challenge, don't worry so much about when and all the different external things. Be ready. Be ready. That's the call. Um, I've got several points I want to draw from this, this verse about being ready. First, it takes a long time to purchase the necessary oil of an intimate relationship with the Lord in order to be ready when the Lord comes for us. Whether at the end of the age or the end of our life, no one has the time to get sufficient oil when we hear the shout of the bridegroom's coming, whether he's coming for us individually or whether he's coming at the end of the age. It takes time to purchase oil. Second, oil must be purchased regularly. The lamps themselves and the flasks that held the extra oil were small and had to be replenished frequently. Likewise, we must be regularly going to Christ to purchase oil. We can't encounter him once and then go back to a lukewarm lifestyle. We must regularly be about the task of making ourselves ready, not be lukewarm toward this. Third, no one can purchase oil for you. and we, we dealt with that. Everyone must go to the dealers themselves to purchase oil. And then fourth, the verse tells us that those who have purchased oil, sufficient oil throughout their life will enter the marriage supper of the Lamb, whereas those who don't will be excluded. Um, so it's important. It's an important issue, very important issue that will affect our eternity. No. Now, verse 11. Later the other virgins came, saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Now, I've got a lot of information in the notes. I'm not going to go through all of it. It would be too tedious probably to, to speak but the two Greek words for no, uh, two primary Greek words for no, gnosko and oida. Uh, and this word is oida. And so, you know, some of the commentary, the lexicon say they basically have the same meaning, and, and, but others say that there's more of a uh, perception, a divine perception uh, there. Vine's dictionary says this about oida. It comes from the same root as edon, which means to see, and is, is a perfect tense with a present meaning signifying primarily to have seen or perceived, hence to know, to have knowledge of, or to know absolutely as in divine knowledge. 
Uh, Biblehub.com says it means to see with true perception. So here's the, the point. He said, I, don't, I do not know you. Now he's saying, <coughs> the Lord is not saying here, you know, that I don't have any idea who you are because he's omniscient. He knows us all. But what he's saying is that, based on the meaning of this word and the context, he's saying, okay, and it, there's also the word truly, which means, you know, absolutely. So he's saying, I, the Lord's saying, I have divine, divine perception, and I know all things, and I look, I look into your heart. I can look into your heart with absolute certainty, absolute perception. He can do that for every one of us. And I, you know, and that in itself, it's like, oh my goodness, you know, um, he looks into my heart. Hopefully he sees something good there. Uh, <laughs> but he can look with absolute certainty into my heart, into our hearts. And he's saying to him, I don't know you in terms of a intimate, personal relationship. I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't see. I don't have that. You, you don't have that experience there with me. And he's not casting them into the into hell. But he's saying those that will enter into the the marriage supper. I'll I'll know who you are in terms of a relationship with me. And I know this is a challenging. I hope you're. Are you being challenged by this teaching? Anybody being challenged? I'm, I am. I hope. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. We got one person being challenged here. Okay. All right. So we have to. He has to know us. And the way he knows us is when we have this history in him of seeking him in this intimate, private relationship. Let's see what else I got here. Okay, then 13. It's the last verse. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. Uh, so we must remain watchful. Now watchful and, and alert doesn't mean just like, okay, I'm looking up at the sky, okay, I don't see the clouds parting, so I'm okay for today. You know, it's not that kind of alertness. That's part of it, maybe. But it's being on the alert in terms of, you know, paying attention to these things, being watching. I say, okay, if the Lord says this during the last week of his earthly life, uh, you know, it's, the, it's part of the last parables he, he shared there then it must be pretty important. And so I want to devote my life to, to pursuit of these things, to be ready in this particular area. Um, uh, so that's what me, alert means, be watchful uh, in those kind of issues. Um, okay, that's all I had in my notes. But here's what I, I just want to summarize it. You know, Jesus started out when they went to the Mount of Olives, they asked him, okay, what, what's the end times going to be like? And he says, be ready. And then he gives these three parables, the parable of the two servants, the parable of the ten virgins, and the parable of the talents. There's no uh, gap in between. It's one right after another in the scriptures. And he's say, so he's saying, in this context, he's saying to be ready, you have to be, remember in the first parable, he connected it to the parable of the ten virgins and the parable of the talents. You know, with the, who's the wise, who's the faithful and wise servant? I'm going to put you in charge. Delay. You know, all the, there's different little nuggets from that parable that connects to the other two. So he's talking about that in that connection. And he's saying to them basically this point, 
Blessed is the one who he finds so doing. So doing. Doing what? Doing what he talked about in the parable of the ten virgins and what he talked about in the parable of the talents. So there's a twofold objective of the bride making herself ready as it's described in these, two, in these parables. One, the bride who will be made ready is the one who's developing an internal relationship with the Lord. An, an, an intimate, personal relationship. Again, knowing that we're all different and the Lord knows what, we, what he wants us specifically to do to develop our own internal, personal relationship. But we need to seek him. We cannot be lukewarm, like it said. We cannot be lukewarm in that preparation, in that pursuit of that. We, we must seek him and ask him what he wants of us in, those, in that and go about that. So that's the first part of be found so doing is that internal relationship with the Lord. And the second part is the parable of the talents to be using the gifts that he's given or gifts that he's given to you. You know, and a talent was a large amount of money. So he's entrusted something big to you. And it's different amounts. Some had five, some had two. One had five, one had two, one had only one. But, you know, a talent was, I didn't do the research, go back and remember exactly how much it was, but it was a lot of money. Now, it's not just talking about money, though. But he's saying, I've entrusted something to you. Be about doing that. And we can't be that one who says, that's just going to be me and Jesus. And I'm going to just hide, hide it. Because that one is cast out into the outer darkness, which is outside the banquet hall. So we need to be about those two things. In this context of these three parables, he said, you need to be about developing that internal relationship with the Lord and using what God has entrusted to us to serve one another. Both are important. Uh, and we need to be found so doing those things. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, let's stand up and let's pray. Father, help us to be found so doing. It's a challenge to each and every one of us who are here personally, as each and every one of us who will watch this online. Help us to be a disciple who will be found so doing, internally seeking you, but also doing what you've called us to do. We want to be a bride made ready. We want to enjoy the marriage supper of the Lamb. We want to be your eternal partner. So we ask, oh God, for you to empower us, each and every one of us, in all these ways. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Uh, yes, yeah, so we will end the online service there. And, uh, and I'll turn it over to Brian. That was a, a really powerful message. Um, let's, let's just take a second right now and just wait on the Lord for what he wants to do next. Just, just, uh, just stay in the presence of the Lord right now. <clears throat> Lord, we just come to you. And Lord, we pray that, Lord, we would be led by the Holy Spirit right now in what you want to accomplish and what you want to do, Lord.